here talking to Tim Bowling about his book, In the Suicides Library. So Tim, um, this book, your book centers on a poet named Weldon Keyes, and I'd like you to tell us about this man and why he made such an impression on you. Absolutely. Um, Weldon Keyes is what we call, I guess, um, a Renaissance man. He was uh, a Nebraskan, mid-20th century. Um, it was when he was most active, the 40s and uh, into the 50s. He moved from Nebraska to um, New York, and uh, he was always a writer. He was uh, a novelist, a short story writer, and a poet. Um, but he also painted. He was abstract expressionist. He hung out with Jackson Pollock and, and that group. And then he eventually found his way to California, and while he was in California, he got fascinated with um, avant-garde photography, um, filmmaking. He was an experimental filmmaker. Uh, he was a, a pianist, and he, he was a big jazz fan. Um, so he was very active uh, with music. Uh, he wore a lot of different hats and moved around uh, between the different uh, creative outlets uh, quite a bit. Um, but he's best known as a poet, um, and maybe for not the best reasons, he's considered probably one of the bleakest and darkest poets in uh, human history. Uh, extremely um, bitter and dark vision, um, which is not mine uh, at all. So I was fascinated uh, by him for that reason alone, is what makes a person be that way. Um, because I do have, like most of us, I do have some darkness in me and some bitterness in me, but I choose not to pursue it, um, certainly not in my art, uh, which he did. So I was interested in him for that reason alone. And uh, there was a book that had been in Weldon Keyes' personal library that mm -hmm. you encountered here in Edmonton, mm -hmm. and that book was kind of the catalyst for mm -hmm. this one. So tell us about that book. Well, the book in the Suicides Library is all about books and reading and about loving books. And uh, um, Weldon Keyes, one of the, f the only thing Weldon Keyes had, I mean, he was, he's best known probably for his mysterious death. He either uh, jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge and killed himself in 1955, um, or he disappeared into Mexico. Um, he talked about doing both. So he's kind of legendary, uh, legendary that way. Um, but I had heard of him as a poet, and uh, I mentioned he was bleak. And uh, his most famous poem is called For My Daughter. Uh, and it ends, these speculations sour in the sun, I have no daughter, I desire none. So it's kind of a trick poem. It's a sonnet, and it ends, and it's sort of, oh, geez, he talks about it having a daughter and then he says I don't have one I don't want one so you can see how dirty so anyway I'm, I'm in the University of Alberta's uh, wonderful Rutherford Library which uh, I believe is still the seventh largest uh, research library in North America it's a wonderful all that oil money in the 60s uh, um, I'd like to think all the oil money we're supposedly have now would go to bu books you know but uh, I don't know that if it does <laughs> I don't know if it does anymore I doubt it um, but it did at one time. Uh, Bruce Peel, I think when he was the librarian, the, the special collections librarian, the, the library at the U of A is named for him. When he was a uh, librarian, I guess he'd go down to, uh, with all his big Alberta money and would go down to California and New York and different places and, and back the trucks up and just buy loads and loads of books and bring them back. So anyway, I was in the Rutherford Library and I, I love browsing there because it's just, you never know what you're going to find. There's amazing books there. And I pulled out a Wallace Stevens uh, collection of poetry. Wallace Stevens, one of the great poets uh, of, the, of the 20th century American poets. Uh, his book called Ideas of Order. And it was just an ordinary looking thin little volume of poetry. And I, I stood there and I flipped it open. And, and uh, right there on the first you know, free end paper, the first page inside uh, the book, there was this most gorgeous calligraphic dark ink black signature, all by itself on a page, Weldon Keys. And I gasped. I mean, I was literally stunned because, first of all, it was, I mean, no student had doodled over this for, <laughs> for however many years, but also just 
I knew of Weldon Keys because I'm a poet and I've, I've written and published a lot of poetry and I've come upon his name and I knew about the legend. And so I was just stunned. I sat and I, I stood there just staring at this thinking, well, is it his name? It has to be his name. Who would write his name in a book? I mean, it's yeah. so beautiful too. It's gorgeous. And uh, I thought, well, how did it get here? How is it in, in you know, a university library in Edmonton, this, this book that clearly, had, and this, you know, I'm somewhat of a book collector, so I knew that, you know, people write their, their names in books as ownership signatures. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's to mark that it's his. So I stood there thinking this book had belonged to, to Weldon Keys. So then that set me off because I thought, well, what, you know, I want to find out more about him now. I knew a little bit about him. I want to find out as much as I can about him. One of the things I did find out was that um, when he died or and or disappeared, the only thing of any value that he had in his estate was his book collection, his library. Mm -hmm. So the title in the Suicides Library. So I decided one thing that I would try to do is I would set out to see if how much of his library I could uh, I could gather. If he signed one book, this book then no doubt he had signed others and they got scattered to the winds and so I thought well I'll, I'll see if I can uh, find out about his life and maybe track down some of these some of these lost books. So you had a quest then? <laughs> Absolutely a quest and you know it, it's definitely the book is definitely a quest narrative there's a, there's there's that element to it it's a mystery. Right um, you do mention in this book that you started in book collecting in 2004 mm -hmm. Now, would you say there's a difference between bibliomania mm -hmm. and book collecting? And if so, you know, how would you describe that difference? Oh, absolutely. I think um, bibliomaniac, I think, basically implies someone who, who could collect anything, almost. It's when collecting becomes an addiction and almost what you collect is almost secondary um, to the act of collecting. And a book collector, I think, always stays pretty focused on the idea that I'm, I'm building a library and I'm collecting the books. Now, the old chestnut used to be that a book collector reads what he buys, you know, and, and, and a bibliomaniac just buys and doesn't even bother reading it, right? So, right. so there's been, for centuries, there's fun, fun has been made of book collectors as, as, you know, bibliomaniacs, as people who aren't really interested in reading. They're interested in just collecting objects. Um, one of my fascinations with the whole notion of book collecting is as, as a writer, very few writers are interested in books from that angle. Um, very few writers, because, you know, let's face it, book collecting is all about what edition you have. You want the first edition. You want the first appearance of the book. Well, writers aren't interested in first editions because they want, you know, 50 editions. You know, writers are, <laughs> writers are interested in, in, in multiple printings of, of books. Um, not, not uh, you know, very few, and then move on. So um, all of this sort of became a, but it's it's it really linked to my life and my struggles as a writer myself. I'm going through, um, you know, trying to work as a full-time writer in Canada and knowing very, very well what Weldon Keyes' struggles were like as an artist and, and having great sympathy for how hard he found it to, to basically finance all his different uh, artistic endeavors. And so all of this kind of came together, um, midlife, mild midlife crisis, I guess. Uh, you know, I have kids and I'll, all these things were working together and suddenly Weldon Keys was in my life and uh, I wanted to sort of put my life into perspective with his. Yeah. So you mentioned that you're a full-time writer. Mm -hmm. It's not an occupation that makes anyone rich in Canada. <laughs> No, not well. No, a, a very maybe, few. Maybe Margaret Atwood. Maybe, maybe a few, but not many. No. Um, so, what drives you to do it? You know, that's a question that uh, really it's, it's hard to answer. Um, I've been asked before. Um, when I was in grade one, and they did the old question about what do you want to be when you grow grow up, and you know, my father was a salmon fisherman at the mouth of the Fraser River. Uh, my family, my, both my parents were, um, grew up in the Depression and uh, dropped out of high school to work. And they weren't, uh, I was the only one in my family who ever went to university. Um, but when I was f six years old, I said I wanted to be a writer. And I think that drive or that desire came purely out of a love of reading first. 
Um, but what motivates me to keep going? I think, uh, what is it about the creative act? And it's the same with Weldon Keys, you know, I think for poets um, or creative people, sometimes a way to fight off the darkness. He may have been a very, very dark and very, very bitter man, um, but he was 41 when he disappeared and or died. Um, so I think, I think the creative act is, is such an affirmative act, even if the product is bleak and dark. I think the act of creating is, is, is itself an affirmation. And I'm fundamentally a, a pretty positive person, even when I'm dark. So I think the act of, of writing for me um, is pleasurable and joyous and, and joy-making and life-affirming. And uh, um, for those reasons, I think that's why I persist. And as a reader, I feel really lucky. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I, I wish there were, you know, a couple hundred thousand like you. So, um, so this book appears very deeply personal. It's mm -hmm. almost confessional. Would, would you call it a memoir? Um, no, not really, not really. And um, the idea of confessional... Um, I'm not sure exactly how confessional it is. It's uh, certainly intimate. Um, I'm very... Uh, all of my writings, I've published uh, 10 books of poetry. I've published uh, my, my new fourth novel, The Tinsmith, has just come out. Um, um, I've published... This is my second work of nonfiction. Um, and if anything marks all of my work, I think it's sincerity. Um, I'm, I'm pretty forthright about what's going on, and, um, but early on, I guess from the age of six, I made, I made a distinction between the written word and, and the lived life, and uh, um, so I also, all writers have an ethical boundary where they will, all writers draw on their own experiences and their own lives, and they, everybody, I, I work with a lot of young writers in different capacities, mm -hmm. and one thing they all have to work out is, am I going to tell these family secrets? Am I going to say these things? Does it matter if it hurts someone or not? And for me, I had a wonderful family. I have a wonderful family. And for me, whatever I say that might be confessional, if it's going to hurt someone, I don't say it. If it's, if it's gen general enough or it's, it's intimate but not in any way that's going to hurt anyone, then, then I will. Um, in this book, uh, it's a blend of, of uh, it's, it's a non-fiction work with, with a fictional narrative, so the facts get kind of blended around. So some things, you get a pretty good sense of my life in Edmonton as a working writer, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't say that it's fully representative. Aha. Uh -huh. You're not going to tell us which parts nah, are true which, which parts are <laughs> well, It's all fundamentally <laughs> true. It's true in spirit, at least, and mostly, actually most of what most of what goes on is true. So did you have an audience in mind when you were writing it? Book lovers, really. Uh, people who love to read. Um, not necessarily writers. You don't have to know anything about 20th century American poetry. That's not important. I think what you do, the people who will really appreciate this book, I think, are just people who are drawn to um, the book itself, first of all, because we're living in this mm -hmm. age, you know, with e-books and the digitization of everything where the actual material book, um, you know, I mean, this it's book, well, yeah, this, uh, sorry, pardon, yes, my, pardon my reach, but this is a, a Gasparo Press production, and if you, you know, you sort of open it up and and uh, yeah. you can see the, the Golden Gate Bridge there on the cover, it wraps mm -hmm. around, and then if you take the cover right off, you can see the detail here, they've got the... They've got the uh, sort of the bridge work on the on the book on the inside, which is which is really cool. Um, and Gasparo Press is this wonderful small Canadian publisher in Nova Scotia that they make mm -hmm. the only publisher in Canada that does everything right down to their making their own paper. Um, so here's a beautiful you know you don't see title pages uh, like this very often you know very. Uh, the it's nice very bold tactile. red. It's yeah. just uh, if yeah. you love books and you love you know the material book, uh, Gasparo books are just are gorgeous. But um, but I you know like many writers, writers aren't that interested in the actual product, the book itself. They don't know much about it. Um, and I became fascinated uh, f fascinated with that. So 
Uh, and I think a lot of people are. I think a lot of people yeah. love just why, what makes a reader? Why are some people, you know, I have kids and I see lots of other kids. Some are just drawn to, some are drawn to, to, to books like Moths to a Flame. And I don't know why, but uh, it's something innate in us, uh, the human instinct for, for story and for the book. You know. mm -hmm. So you've already received a lot of recognition and mm -hmm. awards for your um, books in the past. Um, now you've, you're chosen in the top five for mm -hmm. the Alberta Reader's Choice Award. Mm -hmm. So uh, give us your thoughts on, um, on, on being on this list right now. Well, I'm thrilled. I'm, I'm really delighted. And, and one of the reasons is um, I have three kids. Uh, they're 13, 11, and 9 now. Uh, we have been big library users. Uh, we live in the Mill Creek uh, area of Edmonton, and Old Strathcona is our branch. Mm -hmm. And uh, oh, we would go there, you know, several times a week. And uh, my uh, kids hang out there an awful lot now. And here we are in the downtown, uh, downtown branch. And I basically, you know, if we're not, uh, if we're not at that branch, we're here at this branch, or we're over at uh, Idlewild. Um, so the library has been a huge, a huge part of uh, of, of our lives. Um, a wonderful place to, to come. And so to be part of the the library's book award system is great. And also. Um, I, uh, my family history in, in Alberta is, is quite long. My great-grandparents came here from Ontario in 1905. My father and my uncles were born here in the 20s. Um, I have this attachment to, to Alberta, but I never thought I would, I would live here because I grew up in British Columbia. Mm -hmm. So since I moved to Alberta up in the, oh, the mid-90s, um, uh, I've been embraced, really. By, by so many, so much of the of the culture that's here, you know, in terms of funding organizations and uh, libraries, um, you know, the, the universities, um, I've felt um, very much welcome as a part of this literary culture, uh, artistic culture in Edmonton, and I'm so grateful for that. And this is really um, another part of. It. I'm giving you a long answer to this question because it means so much to me, really. Because this book, as well, it's sort of ironic because it, it, it came out at a time and it kind of had a very quiet life. Um, wasn't very known. What didn't wasn't reviewed um, right away because oh, there's lots. Of, I won't go into the whole thing about reviewing and the difficulties of getting books reviewed now because again, it's that transition from newspapers and print and magazines over to blogs and all the, you know the whole the whole landscape is changing mm -hmm. but um, anybody that puts out a book is looking for ways to get that book to readers and mm -hmm. what could be better than than having a library say we think you should read this book well it's perfect I'm yeah. just very grateful so Alberta Readers Choice Award one of the t titles in the Suicides Library it's by Tim Bowling thanks thanks Lindy